worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory.
Jason Franklin years ago. So we enjoy singing that one. Uh, we would love to have um, the Cole Hart family, Emma Cole, to come this morning to light our Advent candle. They will not dis hurt or destroy on all of my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Isaiah 11, 9 through 10. We are the followers of that root of Jesse Isaiah spoke of. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, and bear fruit worthy of repentance. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 8. We light these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are a people rising towards God's promise. But we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement there are some who hold on to hope and there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel is still our fervent prayer. What a special Christmas that will be for that family. Uh, I think we will, we will have another singer <laughs> sometime in the future. Right, Mama? <laughs> We'd ask our children to join Miss Paula. Um, she's raising her hands in the back. Miss Paula uh, is a very busy lady these days. Uh, she is uh, in White Christmas at our local theater, and uh, there is a a showing today at 2 and then next weekend, so please add that to your list to celebrate the, uh, the season um, with our local talent and um, those who are working so hard to, to bring our theater to life. It's just a wonderful opportunity, and I um, saw the reviews, and I hope to see it today, so uh, join me there. That would be great. Oh, oh yes, and there is a praise. Uh, the Colliers, Miss Emmy Jane, came home yesterday, um, so they're going to be um, uh, nestled in their home until February. So um, we will continue to pray and lift them up. They're um, not going to be around and about us too much. They uh, uh, want to keep away from the germs, but that's just a praise. Amen. 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 <laughs> Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, you did it again. Lord, you've brought us together in your holy house, Lord, to worship you and to praise you. Lord, and we just thank you. We thank you for the many blessings, Lord, that you have bestowed upon us. Those, Lord, that we're not worthy of, but you are such a good, good father and you love your children. And Lord, we just ask that as we receive this offering this morning, Lord, that we give from our heart, from, from a place of gratitude, Lord, for your blessings. Lord, that others might come to know you. And in this season of giving, Lord, there's so many opportunities in our church to give um, to different um, emphasis, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that you open our hearts and our pocketbooks, Lord, that we might bless others uh, through these opportunities. And we just give you the praise and the honor and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Son of God, 
disappear and I would ask that you pray with me so that we may hear the word of God spirit of the living God fall afresh upon us melt us and mold us fill us and use us 
spirit of the living God fall afresh upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this morning is a little bit lengthy. I have two. The first one is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. This is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. In Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in and needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick, and I was in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and didn't help you? And he'll reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. So I'm going to start a little differently this morning with a few statements that have absolutely no context for you whatsoever. But we'll come back to them in due course, and I wanted them to have landed on you ahead of time. First, God does not need you. You have no strength, no resources, nothing that he does not himself possess and in far greater quantity. The God who spoke all of creation into existence from nothing. The God who saved all of humankind from their sins without help from anyone, he does not need us. Secondly, we cannot do what God does, and God will not do what we can do. We cannot save ourselves nor sanctify ourselves. God does that. But God will not give us good habits or good character. And third, The church is not a place. In every age, the church faces the danger of degrading itself from a movement to a place, from a conduit of God's mighty rushing wind to a place where we seek serene spiritual moments, from a rescue station to a spiritual country club. Okay, so you'll hear those again. So for some reason, I spent a lot of time compared to normal on the title of this message, and normally that would seem fairly stupid because I don't even think about a title typically until the office calls me and says, hey, what's the title of your message this week? But this one, however, really framed the ultimate path of the message, and let me tell you, I had some great ones, but I settled on the grace trap. So what's the grace trap? I suggest that the grace trap is the way in which we can be deceived about our salvation and what obedience to God in Christ is actually supposed to look like. I believe this to be a common trap, and I also have to tell you how the scriptures just seem to open to reveal this message. Now, we're taught with complete clarity and truth that only God can save and that we are saved by grace. That our salvation is not by works, it is by grace. 
a gift. It's undeserved. It's freely given. Our forgiveness, and therefore our salvation, is purchased at an infinite price by our Savior, something we can never earn. But it comes through a relatively simple act of believing that he is who he says he is, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is not initiated by us. This is initiated by God. Our invitation was not to God to save us. He did this long ago, and he has done everything already for this, and he invites us. He's done everything other than make our decision for us to ask for that forgiveness, to accept his love, and to love him back. Now, a way to illustrate this is to imagine that you're floundering hopelessly and alone in the middle of a dark, dark ocean, a thousand miles from land, and no hope to make it on your own out of this deadly situation. You're not even on the surface. You're 500 feet down. You cry out to God to save you, and then God, in his infinite love and mercy, immediately picks you up. And he places you on a beach or a cliff at the edge of the ocean. And you're saved. You're on dry land. It stands to reason that we have three choices at that point. We can turn around and go back in the water. We can stay where we are or we can begin to move a little further up and a little further in. You see, that's where the trap happens. Becoming a Christian, being saved through faith by grace, it isn't the finish line. It's the starting line. So here is the heart of my message today. The Gospels and the Epistles clearly tell us that we are saved by grace. We are forgiven. We are rescued. And they also tell us that we're expected to live and act out our faith as children of God in response to that amazing grace. While we're not saved by works, we are most definitely commanded to be a people of action. Faith and love can be nouns, but Jesus tells us that he expects them to be verbs. And that church isn't a place for us to be fed but rather, church is a people that feeds others. And it's also very clear that it matters a lot. So I mentioned that I spent a bunch of time on the title for some reason. And I had some really catchy ones like, so many verbs, so little time. And my favorite, be the verb. You have to admit that would make a cool t-shirt. But it's incredible how clear it is in Scripture that we are taught and commanded to act. We are told to work out our salvation by Paul. We are told to reflect God's love out to our neighbors, to strangers, to our enemies, and to the world by Jesus, by Peter, by James, and by John. Over and over and over, starting with Luke's account of John the Baptist in the wilderness as Jesus' ministry was just about to begin. These crowds of people of all different types come out to see John. And they ask this question. What shall we do? Now they expected some religious answer, of course. But you know what he said? He said, share. If you have two shirts and someone needs one, give them one of yours. He said, do what is right. Not just what's permissible. Not just what is legal and do what is just, not just what is justifiable. You see, it's not about deep teaching or deep theology. It's about deep doing. If you want to experience God, you go where he is at work. You interact with those that he loves and that are in need physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. God doesn't just command us to go do things for him. 
what he's actually doing is inviting us to join him and be part of the kingdom drawing near to others. Jesus over and over instructs us that it really is all about the verbs. Give generously, forgive, pray, act. Do you remember the rich young man? He asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response was to obey the commandments. But then he told him that one thing he so obviously lacked. So he said to him, because of his devotion and his reliance upon his wealth and his love for the world, he said to him, sell all you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. Sell, give, come, follow, verb, 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 verb. We can see it. God's gift of forgiveness and grace is essential to our salvation, but he just places us at the edge of the land, our starting line. And he goes on and on. The parable of the talents or the bags of gold, you all remember that one. It's clear. What will you do with what I have entrusted you with? And do you remember what Jesus said about the one who did nothing? with what he was entrusted with. They were hard words from our Lord. And right on the heels of that parable, here comes the one about the sheep and the goats that we just read. I want you to hear again the actions that resulted in their inheritance of the kingdom prepared for them since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And when they asked when this happened, he said, when you did these things for the least of these brothers of mine, you did them for me. And again, it does not go well for those in the parable who call him Lord, but didn't do those things. Jesus' teaching goes on. He said, you can tell a good tree by the fruit that it bears. A good tree bears good fruit. Well, what good fruit is he talking about? Obviously, it is all those verbs. I mean, how can we bear fruit if it isn't all about what we do? It's the grace trap. Can you see the trap of thinking that being saved is the end and missing that it's just the very beginning? I'm saved, it's finished. But scripture is so clear that the trap is there. Like quicksand. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That does not sound like standing still on the edge of the land. Our danger, especially here in the West, and in our modern time, is that we can fall easily into consumer Christianity. The what's in it for me Christianity, where we focus on whether or not we are being fed. Where we treat God like some kind of supernatural vending machine that we expect to give us what we desire. Where we spend plenty of time and energy on whether someone is wearing or not wearing the right things, what they're doing or not doing in church, whether we like the music or the lighting or the sermon or whatever the current maybe Facebook outrage is or our latest grumble about this place. Yet, we don't give a thought to the literally thousands of people within five or ten miles outside of our door who are on a path to death or who are hurting, hungry, lonely, or afraid. How often do we grieve because this room couldn't even hold the number of people in the world who will die of starvation over the next 45 minutes and half of them will be children? You see, we're so blessed. We don't see it. But we've been given the scriptures with clear direction. Jesus' very words from everyone who has been Given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. 
Friends, I'm not trying to condemn you or depress you. I promise I'm not. But I'm so personally convicted and I'm trying to share what I believe is hidden in plain sight in God's word. This has eternal consequences for each of us. What shall we do? Well, we should pray without ceasing. We should read our Bibles and know what is in there constantly. And we should simply act whenever given the opportunity. And you know, be the verb. Like I said before, God doesn't just command us to do things for him. He invites us to join him and be part of the kingdom, drawing closer to others. And it must be with the right heart to make this our way of life because of our gratitude and our recognition that we were plucked from death undeserving and saved. Now, if we do this, we find that we risk some comfort, some security, some financial gain. Becoming who God wills us to become can be messy and deep. It can be really deep. I mean, we'll encounter people that make us uncomfortable, who have problems that we simply can't solve. But solving the problem isn't the point. Loving them is the point. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. If they're hungry, give them something to eat. If they're in need of encouragement, Simply encourage them. If someone has fallen on hard times, regardless of the reason, love them in the most loving ways out of respect and obedience and adoration to our God and our Savior. And do it without string. Give generously. Relieve suffering in all of its forms whenever possible. Be kind. Listen to them and actually hear them, whoever them happen to be. You see, we can share the love and relationship of Jesus with them with words, and we need to. But we must show them Jesus by loving them in whatever way they need to be loved. If we choose to be hearers only, if we choose to live the what's-in-it-for-me Christianity, then whether we know it or not, our faith is dying. If we continue on that path, our faith will die because it will have no substance. It won't be able to stand up to the self-pity, the temptations, the sorrows, the challenges, the tragedies that this life will absolutely bring each of us because it will be flat and lifeless. It will be two-dimensional. It is why many lose their faith. You see, our definition of a good day is too focused on us. I believe God's definition of a good day is when we make it about others reflecting His love out to them. The church is not a place. J.D. Greer writes that in every age, the church faces the danger of degrading itself from a movement to a place, from a conduit of God's mighty rushing wind to a sacred place where we seek serene spiritual moments, from a rescue station to a spiritual country club. We have a choice. We can quietly tend our own personal spiritual garden focusing on our needs and being fed spiritually. Or we can take faith in the love and the clear commands of our Lord and we can storm the very gates of hell, which Jesus said will not stand against his church. His church. Not the place. You. Me. Us. The mission, the movement, And all that action. Now now that we know with certainty that our salvation was the starting line, we can run the race. 
Now that we're on dry land, we can move and build and give and act and love. We can be who we are called to be. Faithful servants, fruit-bearing, active, loving, giving, becoming three-dimensional, becoming more. Now, before you get too overwhelmed with the endless and huge task that is to be the rest of our lives, let me remind you that God does not need you. You have no strength, no resources. You have nothing that he himself does not already possess in far greater quantity. The God who spoke all of creation into existence from nothing the God who saved all of humankind without help from anyone. He is perfectly whole and complete and all-powerful. He does not need us. Oh, but He simply wants us. He calls us. He invites us so that we may become more. We are to become who He intends us. For us to be who he created us to be you see we are saved first and then we may become our ultimate selves the beings that he created us to become he expects it he expects us to become more because we cannot be ready for eternal life in his kingdom if we do not do the will of our father in heaven He said so. Oswald Chambers wrote that we cannot do what God does and God will not do what we can do. We cannot save ourselves nor sanctify ourselves. God does that. But God will not give us good habits or good character. Honor, integrity, kindness, mercy, He will not force us to love him or to give of ourselves to our fellow man. In other words, he gives us everything that we need. He redeems us from our sin. He pours out his love upon us and then he leaves it up to us to live like it. To make our faith live. And to become what he created us to be by actively caring for others, for each other. Now I'll close by giving you this question. One that I think all of us should ask ourselves. When I have a good day, or a great day, is it because I got good things? Was it great because my focus on myself was rewarded? Or was it a good or a great day because in some way, great or small, I took advantage of God's invitation to step a little further from that edge. To move a little further up and a little further in. To become a little bit more. Let's be that beacon of light in a world that feels increasingly dark. Let's be that church that storms the very gates of hell. Let's become that church together. And let's be the verb in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shall stand with us and sing, Oh, come all ye faithful this morning.
ask that you stand and sing with us. Oh, come all you faithful. could help um, pick up the chairs uh, we're going to stack them in eight high and please don't slide them and we will move them somewhere Where's my phone uh, they'll move them with a hand truck so you don't have to move them around so thank you Dave <laughs> you bet so you hear the benediction may the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the abundant love of God the Father and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.